So today we're going to be focused on dry beans and uh, Matt Ryan and Sarah Pethabridge, both from Cornell University, are joining us today to talk about some of the innovative research that they've been doing with, with dry beans focused on pest and weed control, always <laughs> oh, constant issues in, in agriculture. And so always great to hear about new innovations on that front, which we'll hear about today. And I'm going to kick us off, kick us off, not kick us off. I shouldn't say that on a webinar. Start the webinar. <laughs> um, by highlighting a new project that Matt and myself and Kristen, who's on here, and I think Ivy might be on here as well, um, that we were just awarded from the Northeast SARE Research and Education Program and just awarded, I think, um, right at the beginning of March. So we just want to take a, an opportunity right now to introduce that project because you'll be hearing from us more on dry beans over the next um, couple of years as we continue to build research and outreach and education materials in this topic area. So we want you to know that that's going on. And of course, if you have any interest in learning more or continuing to be involved, in our dry bean project, uh, please let us know. You can just put your information right into the chat and we'll make sure that you get included on our mailing list. So our new Northeast SARE r &E project is called Regenerative Organic Dry Bean Production in the Northeast. And of course, the goal here is to expand organic dry bean production in our region and conduct new and innovative research and create a farmer community of practice. So really work on bringing farmers that are interested in growing dry beans and currently growing dry beans together to learn from each other, but also to learn about some of the new information that's being uh, developed through this program. So really exciting. So again, just to reiterate, we want to continue and work on building a dry bean farmer community and we feel like there's a lot of interest in dry beans, farmers that wanna start growing them, but just lacking support, knowledge and information. So again, trying to get farmers together to share agronomic information, learn about equipment and also market opportunities is a real goal of this project. And we're gonna do that through a variety of mechanisms that uh, we'll be sending out to folks to join in on. And again, if you really wanna be a part of this community of practice, please put your name in the chat and uh, we'll make sure that you're on that list. All right, so as part of our research project or our overall project with the Northeast SARE, they want us to state goals. What do we really hope to achieve through doing this work? And so we set some performance targets is what they're called. So this is what we're trying to achieve. And because of that, we have to keep track of a lot of things throughout the project. So oftentimes you get surveys <laughs> from people after you've you know, engaged in research or maybe showed up at a field day. And part of that is because when we receive funding from someone like the USDA, they wanna know you know, how the money was spent and if it made a difference. So what we want to accomplish through this project is 25 farms on 150 acres will be growing dry beans for commercial sale. So we really want to increase the acreage uh, throughout the Northeast. And we have, you know, some metrics that we're looking at here, you know, really thinking about how many tons of beans are sold and what kind of practices folks are using, but overall, we want to increase the number of acres of dry beans that are going into the marketplace. And we also want to obviously continue to work with farms that are already growing dry beans and uh, work with those folks as well to overcome challenges that they're having in their operation. So we're really focused on t reducing tillage, um, looking at different types of cover cropping, pest management, and variety selection. And then, of course, 
we really want to see marketable yields increase. And as a result, hopefully we see farmers that are gaining more from the crops that they're growing. So these are all the goals that we have for this project. And again, we'll need to be working with all of you and more to make this a reality. Now, um, Kristen's on here today, and she has really been an advocate um, and champion for dry bean production in the Northeast, starting off as um, an undergrad and then a graduate student, and now continuing her work and continuing to push people like myself and Matt and others to keep the research going and trying to increase dry beans and helping the farmers that are out there. So I really want to make sure that she's recognized. And she conducted a survey in 2020 to really look at the needs assessment of current dry bean growers, but also those farmers that would really like to start growing dry beans, but feel that there are various barriers keeping them from doing that. And you can see the biggest challenges that were outlined um, by bean growers. And one of the top ones, of course, is weed control. So that's something we're focused on in this new project. And we'll hear a little bit about today from Matt Ryan. And then of course, a whole host of other issues around pest management and harvesting and, and marketing. And again, we're hoping to start <laughs> to work on many of these and help people gain more market, more yields and bring more people into the bean growing market. All right, so here's just a, another look at needs that folks have um, in the dry bean industry, especially the organic industry. And you can see access to equipment primarily, but also markets and agronomic information. So a lot of these needs we're hoping to start addressing in this project and maybe be able to continue in, in also future work that we're all um, looking at as well. All right, so I think I've nearly taken up my, my 10 minutes, but these are the research activities that we'll be looking at. We're going to start off with a variety trial this spring that um, uh, Kristen and Ivy and I are working on selecting the variety. So if you have any Thing in particular you think that we should look at, again, please reach out or put it in the chat. We're also going to be looking at seeding rates of black beans into rolled and crimped rye and looking at how different market classes also do in these organic no-till systems compared, compared to conventional till. So all of this research will be um, kicked off pretty soon in the next couple of months. All right, so just wanted to quickly share this new and exciting project on dry beans. Certainly always looking for your feedback. And again, like I said, if you want to make sure, oh, I see Kristen put in a contact form. She is so on top of it and she's on vacation. So that's pretty amazing. Nice job, Kristen. And if um, you want to get on our contact list directly about dry beans, please fill that out. And uh, again, any um, varieties you would like us to look at, please put them in the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to be talking to us about some of her work in disease management and organic dry beans. Thanks very much, Heather. And thank you for the opportunity today to talk to you about our research into the potential of cereal rye mulch to suppress one of the major diseases of dry beans and soya beans white mold in no-till situations. So today I'm going to give you a, a review of the basic facts around white mold and why we looked at rolled rye to try and control this disease from a different angle. We'll talk about the rationale, as I said, we'll talk about our approach, our field trial, and our results and what this means in terms of the implications for disease management in no-till situations. So just as a review, white mold, as you probably know, is caused by the fungus Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. 
One of the hallmarks of this pathogen is that it has a very broad host range. So it can infect over 400 plant species, many of which are vegetables and field crops found within our intensive cropping rotations in the Northeast. And in general, we have a very low tolerance to crop rejection. So if we see white mold, that crop may be bypassed in certain processing situations. So why do we worry about white mold? Well, firstly, because of direct crop loss. So it can cause premature pod abscission, reducing the number of harvestable pods. It causes a reduced number of beans per pod because we get less green leaf area, less energy pushing into the pods. And we might get poor bean quality because of that same problem. And we might get product contamination as well. So you can see here these black resting structures of the fungus called sclerotia that form in place of the beans within the pods. And of course, we wanna separate those out from our beans, which we want to sell. But the other reason we can worry about white mold is indirect crop loss as well. So on the diseased plant parts, as you can see here, we get the production of that sclerotia. Those sclerotia fall back into the soil surface and then form inoculum for future susceptible crops in the rotation. So we get direct loss in terms of the crop that we're growing in that particular season, but then increased risk in future susceptible crops. This is the life cycle of the fungus, which we're just gonna to review to look more at the rationale about why we looked at cereal rye. So to start with, the fungus survives as those sclerotia in the soil for very long periods, several years at least. When the conditions are right, they'll germinate into these small mushroom, small brown type structures. On those small mushrooms, we get the production of ascospores, which you can see here, they're small colorless balls and they're liberated into the wind. Once they're liberated into the wind and they will happen to land on a flower, they can infect the flowers and use the dead dying flowers of our beans as a nutrient source to be able to infect the green pods and stems directly. So it needs to infect flowers first, then go to produce symptoms in our crop. And the symptoms I'm sure you might be familiar with, these bleached necrotic lesions, plus the signs of the pathogen, which are these cottony mycelia, which then form back into those sclerotia that fall back into the soil surface. One thing we do know about white mold is the inoculum generally comes from within the field. Those ascospores don't tend to get um, out of the canopy from the next door's field or down the valley. And that's pretty much because there were those small colorless balls. So they're very susceptible to ultraviolet light degradation. So anything that does escape the canopy can be broken down quite quickly by light. But one of the problems in managing white mold by managing the sclerotia within the soil is that we only need a very small number of sclerotia to get significant crop loss in dry beans. We only need one sclerotia per row meter of beans to produce many ascospores from those small mushrooms, which goes on to create significant crop loss. So in terms of management and things we can do prior to the crop, is crop planting and things that we can do within the season, we need to be able to rely on a jigsaw puzzle of different strategies. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. The strategies for this disease are quite well known. One of the most important things we can do for managing white mold, if we've had a problem in that field in the past, is rotating to non-hosts, plants that the fungus cannot infect. And that really means corn and grain. But it also means effective weed control in these crops because the fungus can infect many of our broadleaf weeds found within our rotation. And if we're getting perpetuation of the inoculum in the soil through weeds, we're not getting the full benefits in rotating to no ho non-hosts for um, disease interruption. 
Now we know there are some strategies that we can use as trade-offs for disease as well. Things like wider row spacing, decreased plant populations, weed management, upright varieties, all aim to manipulate the microclimatic conditions within the canopy. We get more airflow through the canopy, we get less white mold, but the problem is that many of these strategies also have trade-offs with yield, decreased plant populations, for example, and wider row spacings may not be practical with our current setup of our planters or our harvesters. We know that there's also fungicides, both conventional and OMRI listed fungicides available to us for using within the season. And I've just listed several of the more commonly used conventional fungicides for white mold in dry beans in New York. But I'd also encourage you to check in in your particular state on what is registered. And we know for fungicides to be effective, timing is critical. We need to be able to time our fungicide with um, early flowering. So we're protecting those early flowers and blossoms from infection by those ascospores because infected blossoms are the only source of the inoculum, which is going to infect our green pods and stems directly. But we wanted to take a different approach in this project. Most of our strategies and most of the research goes towards which fungicides are effective because we need to try and protect the blossoms. But we wanted to see what can we do to the sclerotia within our northeast cropping rotations to be able to make a difference as well, to try and block the sclerotia from germinating to start with. Firstly, we know that the sclerotia that contribute to the disease are really only within the top inch of that soil profile because they have to have enough energy to reach out from the soil surface and produce those small mushrooms. Now, in, as a function of this, in the Pacific Northwest, many of the intensive cropping rotations apply fungicides through the irrigation water to do just this. But in the Northeast, we don't have a lot of irrigation infrastructure and we'd like to try and incorporate no-till and cover crop um, rotations in there so could we use cropping rotations and no-till production um, to do the same thing, block the production of apothecia? So the objective of our research over the last few years has been to try and quantify the efficacy of rolled crimped cereal rye, mulch on white mold, weed populations, biomass and yield in dry beans and soybeans. And of course, many of you will be familiar with the rolled crimp cereal rye system. Matt here is an expert on this system, but it's basically where we plant cereal rye in fall. We then let it grow. It doesn't winter kill over that winter period. It then grows rapidly in spring. And before planting our main crop, we push it down with this roller crimper and we're able to crimp or crush the vascular system of the plant in place so it dies in place in a layer on that soil surface. And then we can plant our main crop directly into that residue. It has applications to directly harvestable dry beans, such as blacks. And of course, some of our other um, specialty crops, specialty market classes may also be directly harvestable as well. So the rationale behind this strategy in our research was looking at trying to prevent that germination of sclerotia. And we know that light interception to the sclerotia is important in whether it germinates or not. So reducing the light from that rolled crimp cereal rye mulch may reduce the germination. Even if we do get germination, those ascospores that form on those mushrooms may be diluted into the canopy because of that physical barrier. So we may get less ascospores as well. And of course, there's other, barrier, uh, other benefits associated with rolled crimp cereal rye, such as weed suppression, the no-till situation, so improvements in soil health, and reduced tillage. Because every time we till the soil, we deliver a new sclerotial population to the soil surface within that top inch. And again, they can survive and germinate. 
So keeping them lower in the soil profile will promote their decay by natural micro, naturally occurring microorganism populations. So our trial was located at the Cornell facilities in Geneva. We had strips of cereal rye planted at cultivar Aristook, and we planted that on the 18th of September. Our plots were quite large, 40 feet long by 204 feet wide. And then we let those grow over winter and we compared these to fallow plots. So areas where we did not plant cereal rye in winter. We rolled and crimped those plots on the 31st of May at that critical time. And then we planted our main crops on the 7th of June. Now there was a delay in that. Ideally, it would have been a one pass system, but it just so happens we got a significant rainstorm on that same day we rolled and crimped. So we had to delay until we could get back on the field. Our main crops were soya beans and black beans. And of course we compared it to our fallow areas. This is just a picture of what our trial looked like when we were rolling and crimping that cereal rye. So you can see we had alternating plots of rolled crimp cereal rye and fallow areas as well. Now, some of the indicators we wanted to look at were we started with plant density. So for the dry beans, the rolled crimp cereal rye had no significant effect on plant population or plant density. Remarkably, we did have some reductions in plant populations in our soya bean plots, 45% less in our rye plots compared to our um, fallow areas. Now for crop biomass, we looked at that twice throughout the season. So mid-season, the 19th of July, in dry beans, we did get a lag in biomass in our rye plots. So 63% less biomass compared to our fallow areas. Similar situation in our soya bean plots. When we did the same thing again on the 31st of August, we the dry beans had caught up. There was no significant difference in crop biomass above ground between our fallow and our rolled crimp cereal rye plots. There was still a lag that had hung on at that time in soya beans. Now, when we got to harvest, in terms of yield pod weight and pod number, on the 12th of September in dry beans, we found that pod weight increased by 88% in those rye plots. And our pod number was not significantly different. So presumably we had significantly heavier pods, not more pods. For our soya beans, pod weight was reduced, but pod number was not different in between those treatments. We did get some interesting effects from the effect of the rolled crimp cereal rye. So here in the foreground of this picture, you can see um, our, fallow, um, our fallow plots. And in the, uh, sorry, the other way around, in our um, rolled crimp cereal rye plots, whereas in the background here, we can um, see that these plants are dying off. This is in the soya bean situation in our fallow plots. So perhaps the rolled crimp cereal rye made soil moisture hang on for longer and therefore did have an effect on the natural senescence of those plants. So in getting to the main part of the story in terms of white mold, we did have significant reductions in the incidence of white mold in both soya beans and dry beans, significantly less in our rolled crimp cereal rye plots compared to our fallow areas. We also wanted to know what was going on with our sclerotia. So we put six sand filled pots with sclerotia out into our field plots, some, and we put them in line with the soil surface. So these sclerotia were conditioned, so they've got to have a cold period to be ready to germinate. And so we induced that cold period in the laboratory prior to placement in the field. So again, in our fallow plots and under our cereal rye plots, as you can see here. What we found was really interesting and, cons and consistent between the soya bean and the dry bean main crops. To start with, the incidence of germination of the sclerotia 
resulting in those fully formed mushrooms, so functional apothecia, was significantly reduced in our cereal rye plots. But the effect was the opposite in terms of the incidence of germination resulting in only stalks. So if a sclerotia germinates and produces the stalks, if it doesn't produce the disc, it's not able to produce the spores which infect the flowers. So we did see an in increase in the incidence of sclerotia, which were kind of reaching for the light, trying to get above that cereal rye mulch layer, but they did not form ascospores and therefore did not form inoculum to cause disease in those plots. So overall reductions in the functional apothecia, so those that produce discs and spores from the rye plots, and then a significant increase in non-functional types. So things that produced stalks, but no discs. Now that's important because when they do germinate and produce the stalks, they're only able to do it once. They've used up all their energy. If they don't actually produce ascospores, they're lost to the system. So we might get a gradual reduction in soil-borne inoculum, a purging of that sclerotia in the upper soil profile, which might be especially use, useful in a no-till situation where we're not bringing sclerotia up from lower down in the soil profile. So in conclusion, the best approach for white mould is no doubt a systems approach. It's a very recalcitrant soil-borne disease that requires a lot of different things to be able to make a difference for disease management. But we believe that rolled crimp cereal rye could form one of those jigsaw puzzle pieces for white mold control. It could also reduce soil borne inoculum over time. And of course, we need to look at the trade offs with yield as well. And we're, that's where we're continuing our research in the future. In conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge all the funding provided by the USDA Organic Transitions Program the New York State Dry Bean Council and the collaboration of Matt Ryan, who's about to talk on his research and Brian Brown from New York State IPM. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. If anyone has a, a quick question for Sarah, you can type it in the chat as Matt um, gets his presentation up and ready. And, um, I think we were planning on probably taking some questions at the end and we're right on time. So as long as Matt doesn't go on and on. Uh, watch out. <laughs> I've got 80 slides. <laughs> no, no, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Matt, I'll just um, have you get started and, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. I don't see anything right now. So. All right. Well, thanks, Heather. And thanks, Catherine. I appreciate the invitation to talk with everyone. And it's uh, nice to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in for the, the webinar today. Uh, yeah, and um, I'm glad that I can follow Sarah. I think uh, Sarah's been doing some really fascinating research with with my white mold there. And uh, it's yeah, I've been working on this organic no-till system for a number of years now, and and it's always fascinating to me the new things that we're learning and the uh, the innovations that come along with this the system. Today, I'll be talking about weeds and weed management uh, in this organic no-till system. Uh, and uh, what you're looking at here is just a, a sequence, a timeline, really, of the different activities you know that we typically think of. When we're using uh, the rolled rye organic no-till system for soybean production, so um, this is part of a production guide. I'll I'll talk about in a minute, but just wanted to acknowledge that uh, I'm going to be presenting some uh, research that a lot of different people have contributed to. So um, Annika Roland, graduate student in the lab, Woody Manalid, also a graduate student, uh, Kristen Loria. Um, so she's really a, a driving force behind some of this this uh, research and um, was uh, the person who wrote the, the Sarah proposal that we talked about. Um, Chris Pelzer, Sarah, and then Heather. And getting funding from a number of different sources here. Uh, you can see the logos at the bottom. But as, uh, as Heather mentioned, we have this new, uh, new Sarah grant funded project, um, Regenerative Organic Dry Bean Production. 
And again, Kristen has been the, uh, the person uh, really driving this. Um, and so like uh, Heather was saying, she's uh, been a, a long-term advocate for uh, driving production in the Northeast. And it's just been a pleasure to work with her on this project. Um, so we're gonna be looking at different um, market classes. We're gonna be focusing on these upright varieties for direct combine harvesting. And we really wanna be looking at uh, optimizing practices for this organic no-till system. And so when we're talking about regenerative organic dry bean production, we're really thinking about regenerating soil health. I'm part of the uh, New York Soil Health Initiative down here at Cornell. And so we think about you know, different practices and ways that we can improve soil health, improve water infiltration. We want to be increasing resilience to climate change, increasing resilience to extreme weather events. We wanna be building up soil carbon. And, uh, and so that's, you know, our approach here is really looking at rolled cover crops, producing a lot of cover crop biomass and then no-till planting into that, that biomass, which then serves as mulch to suppress weeds, okay? So this is the, the system. So uh, before working at, at, you know, coming to Cornell, I was at Penn State and before Penn State, I was at the Rodale Institute. And so I was there when they first started working on the, the roller crimper. And it's been really exciting to see this evolve over time. But this is the standard INJ roller crimper that um, that we've been using in our research in our research trials. Again, we're rolling down anthesis at that uh, at that anthesis stage. That's when it's very susceptible to being terminated mechanically. And uh, and again, yeah, this uh, a lot of times this will provide excellent weed suppression. So there are other benefits. Of course, uh, we're very interested in protecting soil from erosion. Uh, I have a lot of different photographs of side-by-side uh, -side plots where you can see that we're even with a you know, relatively small amount of rain, you know, after uh, soybean planting, um, you know, when that, that soil is susceptible to erosion, you know, and get a, a bit of a rain, you can have some washouts. Whereas uh, yeah, with the rolled cover crop system, you know, that's where we really have good protection against uh, soil erosion, better water infiltration. So we have better soil health with our rolled cover crop system. And we also see that there's an opportunity here to reduce labor. And that's really coming from the inter-row cultivation, you know, re eliminating and reducing the uh, several passes of inter-row cultivation, blind cultivation that typically uh, occurs when you're growing uh, uh, soybean row crops like that. Um, so a lot of the, what I'm going to be talking about, some of the background is, is really focused on, on soybeans, um, but uh, we have been working in, in dry bean production as well. And so I'll share some of those results as, as we go on. Okay. For those of you who are interested in uh, the soybean part of this, we did just uh, publish a new production guide and this is available for free online. So there's the, the link to the website there. And this is a summary, a synthesis really of all of our uh, research that we've done over the past decade on this, uh, this system in New York state. It's uh, highly transferable to other, other states as well. Uh, so I think it's relevant for folks in, in Vermont, of course. Uh, and we also, we include our, our research, uh, results from our research trials, but we also include some farmer features. And I feel like, you know, we have a nice balance there where we here, you know, basically have the voice of the farmer and uh, their impressions. And we try to integrate that in. And we talk about um, some of the challenges, you know, with the system and also, you know, what we think it, it really takes to make the system work. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Uh, over the years, we've been looking at a number of cultural practices to make the system work. So timing is really important. You know, we are relying on that, that cover crop to suppress weeds. And, and really, we're asking so much of that cover crop. So we need to be treating it um, uh, properly. We need to be uh, paying attention to it. We need to really be investing in our cover crop. And so early planting is something that you know, we've looked at that really pays off. We've looked at a number of different cultural practices, varieties, timing. Uh, here's uh, seeding rates. So we see with um, higher seeding rate in soybean, we can certainly uh, get better weed suppression. Uh, with the low seeding rate here, you can see all that crabgrass there. And then we went with a higher seeding rate. You know, that's when we're getting much better weed suppression. And when we pencil this out and we look at the economics, we see that it, there's an economic advantage too with going with a higher, much higher than uh, what is typically used in conventional production for soybeans. So uh, again, some of the background work, um, really trying to take what we've done in soybean and now uh, taking a closer look and, and trying to transfer it and see what works with dry bean production. Uh, 
in our lab, in the Sustainable Cropping Systems Lab at at uh, at Cornell, we uh, we really emphasize um, you know proper equipment, and and we we tend to be a uh, maybe a bit more focused on equipment than other labs. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about our planter that we're using, we have a, a relatively new no-till planter and it has some different bells and whistles on it, I, I will admit, um, that I think are, are very beneficial to making the system work, to getting that good seed placement. So there's a video that we put together. This is Chris Belzer in this video talking about going through our planter, uh, highly encouraged encourage you to check that out if you uh, want to know more about what we're using for uh, planting into this uh, rolled cover crop and the no-till mulch there. So again, uh, seed simulation with our, our planter, you know, this has been a challenge for us in the past, but we feel like with the, uh, the setup that we have now, we're getting very good seed placement, you know, we're putting seed exactly where we want it to be. And that, you know, makes such a big difference. Trying to go in with a into this mulch with a, a standard planter um, can be really problematic. And so, uh, so here we're getting good, uh, not only seed placement, but we're getting good uh, depth, depth control. That's been another issue. You can see here in this uh, photograph, side-by-side -side comparison, uh, we did this intentionally. We um, uh, it was, uh, basically planted very shallowly and uh, at a quarter inch depth and then compared that to uh, one and three quarters inch depth. And you know we get much better establishment when we're going down deep. And of course, this you know depends on the weather. Um, if it's wet, you know it's maybe uh, less critical. Under dry conditions, though, that's when you really need to up your game and make sure that you are are doing things properly and getting that seed into the, into some moisture. So this is again just a, a comparison here. But when we we see that we have a poor stand. That's where we all are also seeing uh, some weeds coming in. So it's you know the mulch is protecting, right? Mulch is uh, protecting the the crop from from weeds and um, and doing a good job at suppression. But at some point, the canopy from the soybean kicks in, and it also contributes to that weed suppression that we're seeing. And if you don't have that good canopy, if you don't have a good start establishment with your soybean, that's um, when you're going to get run into some weed problems here. So, you know, night and day difference here with the amount of weeds that were in that shallow planted compared to the, the deeper planted um, soybean there. So I want to talk about some of the graduate students that are working in the lab. So we have Udi Manalid. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you some data from on uh, his work with dry bean and then Annika Roland, um, who's uh, been looking at different weed control tactics. And so I want to share some of her work, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the slides that you're going to be looking at are, are really coming from these these grad students and uh, it's really been nice working with them. So this, this is some data from Udi Manalid and um, what we're looking at here is an experiment where we went in and we compared uh, black bean, uh, organic black bean, uh, that was uh, uh, planted into tilled soil. And we had a, a no-till comparison where the, the black bean was then, uh, was no-till planted into rolled uh, cereal rye mulch there. And there are two different locations. The farm hub is down in the Hudson Valley and then Musgrave, that's by us, uh, closer to uh, Cornell next to um, Cuga Lake here in, in central New York. So you can see here uh, in this particular case, um, in both sites, we had better establishment in with our, our, our no-till system. And so this is uh, a bit different than what we've seen in soybean in, 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 in some years. And so this was uh, really exciting where, where we had uh, you know, very good establishment um, with, our, uh, with our black bean in the cereal rye treatments. And in the, uh, the tilt soil, we had some, some problems and we, you think this is primarily primarily related to uh, a very heavy rainfall event that we saw after planting, uh, right when the the uh, black bean seedlings were emerging, in that bare soil there was some crusting and I think that reduced our stand there. So you can see uh, at the farm hub um, it was pretty consistent. The tilled uh, tilled treatment was lower than the cereal rye treatment and Musgrave there was this. Uh, thing that was happening where the population was going down. So it was more than just the crusting. There was something else. There were some issues that were uh, reducing the population, uh, you know, up to 40 days after planting there. So, uh, but, you know, from the no-till perspective, these are some interesting results. It shows that there's uh, some potential and at least in some cases where there may be an advantage of having that mulch in terms of uh, getting better establishment. When we look at the weed biomass, so I know there's a lot to look at here on this uh, on this slide, but if you just focus on the left, 
Again, we have the farm hub up top and then we have Musgrave down below. And we have three different treatments. This is again, black bean uh, that was um, planted into cereal rye. That's that orange uh, red color there. And then the tilled uh, treatment, um, that's bare soil. And you know that's that blue greenish uh, color there in the bar. And we have this under baseline conditions. The baseline conditions is basically going in, planting, and then leaving it alone. So whatever weed suppression we're getting, it's from that mulch and from the canopy. There was no interrow cultivation, okay, in the tilled soil. So just you know, be aware of that. You know, we're looking at something that is not typical. This is you know, you know, kind of worst case scenario where you go into bare soil and you don't do any kind of mechanical cultivation. So that's what we're looking at over here. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you have the baseline conditions here, and then the the cereal rye mulch, you know, suppressing weeds, right, more than that bare soil without any cultivation. So that's uh, maybe interesting in some ways. Uh, and then we have these weed-free treatments. WF is weed-free where we went in and hand-weeded, okay? It was just that the experiment wasn't really set up that allowed us to do cultivation. So, so we went in and we hand-weeded. We wanted to get a sense of what the yield potential was when we were eliminating weeds completely. And then we have uh, weed-free plus uh, some fertilizer. So I think there were something like 25 pounds of nitrogen that was put out uh, and on top of the, uh, the treatments here. So... Uh, with black bean, um, we know that, you know, we can see sometimes a, a starter fertilizer response, you know, some people are doing that. And then also, um, we know that the cereal rye, it really draws down soil nitrogen. And so we added some uh, additional nitrogen, and that's at WF plus F, right? So the weed-free plus fertilized. And you can see for weeds, you know, they're not supposed to be weeds there in the weed-free, so they're you know, we measured anyway, and I was what was there at the end of the season, but, you know, did a very good job of controlling weeds in those treatments, okay? When we look at yields now, okay, what we see is that, you know, some very high yields of our black beans at the farm hub here, and when we have just standard conditions, the baseline conditions, again, without any cultivation in the tilt soil, we're getting, you know, decent yields with our, our cereal rye there, right? Our cereal rye no-till system. So, you know, for those who are not familiar with looking at yields and kilograms per hectare, just note that, you know, 4,000 here, that's equivalent to 60 bushels per acre. So, you know, these are some nice yields that we're getting out here. Uh, these were hand harvested. So, you know, just keep that in mind. At Musgrave, we did not see as high yields, but we did see this difference of separation from the cereal rye and the till treatment under the weed-free and weed-free plus fertilizer uh, treatment. So we see that there's some advantage, right, with the, uh, the rolled rye uh, no-till black bean system. Uh, under those weed free and weed free and fertilized conditions here. So really exciting. I think there's, you know, there's uh, opportunity here to uh, you know, take what we've been doing in soybean and I think now apply it with, with black beans or with dry beans that can be harvested that are upright that can be drug combined anyway. So that's, um, you know, some data I want to share with you. And then in the lab, you know, my background is in ecological weed management. I work with a lot of organic farmers and I really think about ways, you know, tools and different strategies for helping organic farmers manage weeds. And so we think oftentimes about integrated management or using the many little hammers approach where we're using cultural practices that may not be all that effective uh, when used alone, but when you combine them, that's when we can get good weed suppression. And, um, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, smother cover crops, you know, you know, using extended rotations with forages, right? You know, thinking pretty deeply about this too, you know, trying to manage for specific weeds, you know, weed species, you know, we want to make sure that we're, you know, not developing a perennial weed problem, for example, you know. And then uh, more recently, we've been looking at some supplemental weed control tools, you know, specifically this interrow mower and then a weed zapper. OK, so these are you know, I want to spend the rest of the time here talking about these two tools. And we're really excited about these. These I feel like are, are new and I think, are, are, uh, you know, it's um, you know, something uh, additional now to, to work with you know, a tool that we have to help clean things up if we're not getting that, that weed suppression that we need just from the, uh, the mulch and from the, the canopy and shading from the, 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 the crop there. So there's a, a video that Annika Roland put together uh, recently that's uh, available on, on our website um, that goes through and, and you can see the interrow mower in action. This was custom built by a, a manufacturer or a fabricator up in Manitoba. Uh, we did just purchase a new one. We had so much enough 
success. Our first year that we now purchased a new one, the first original prototype is, is owned uh, by the Farm Hub in, in the Hudson Valley. And now we have our own up at Cornell. This, in case you're curious, this unit cost uh, $31,500. So I know that may be outside of the budget for some people, uh, but I think this is, in my, my opinion, I feel like this is a bit of a game changer. And I think it's really going to enable us to do some things that we haven't been able to do in the past. So really excited about this front mounted hydraulic driven um, set up with parallel linkage there. And so, you know, we can go and get some good uh, steering, good, you know, control of it in terms of placement. And it's uh, been really exciting to work with and see the results from this past year. So uh, of course, we're not the first ones to work with inter-row mowing. Uh, there's been a number of other people that have uh, done uh, this type of work in the past. I wanna draw your attention to Carrie Clark at the University of Missouri. She's done some really uh, interesting work. Uh, you know, some of the uh, first initial work that, that I've seen on inter-row mowing, I feel like people have talked about this idea for a long time, but she uh, you know, put together a prototype, has this great webinar uh, that's online that you can go to. There's a link there and um, uh, just tells you about the evolution of the thinking about this and the testing that was done. She had a graduate student that was working on it. So definitely encourage you to check that out. You know, there was, I was looking last night and finding, uh, you know, who's been doing, uh, you know, other work with inter-row mowing. And there was a SARE project that recently concluded a farmer in Missouri, I think that was working with Kerry Clark, you know, designed a open source um, uh, model here. And so the blueprints, the, the uh, schematics for it are available online, you know, through their, their final report here, but you can check that out. This is a, a maybe a, a different approach. This is a, a rotary type type of blade hydraulically driven um, but you know very very interesting um, you know how they're doing this and somewhat similar to uh, how ours is set up maybe maybe a little bit different though uh, this is a, another person a YouTube video um, looking at basically stringing together a, a bunch of lawnmowers you know, if, you know and these are all separately driven gas power lawnmowers that they hooked up to uh, uh, in the back of a toolbar here. So people have been looking at this. They're going through wheat, just testing it here to see, you know, what the cutting action is like. But, you know, it seems like there's a, a, been a trend now toward uh, interest in inter-row mowing. And, uh, you know, Joe Bassett is another person at Underground Agriculture. They first came out with a, a flail type mower, and the, it's the one on the left. And I was really excited about that. Flail mowing, I think, has may have some advantages, you know, as we see this evolve over time. Uh, they stopped with that model, though, because they couldn't get enough power to that flail. And then they shifted more recently to a more of a sickle bar type of mower. So that's the one on the right. So really interesting, you know, going between rows of crops, you know, people having different strategies, different takes on trying to get this figured out. But uh, to me, you know, as an equipment person, someone who likes the mechanical engineering aspect of this, this type of work, this is really exciting stuff. It's great to see this. And I feel like, it, again, it can really enable us to use some more of these ecological type of practices or these conservation practices that maybe you know, haven't been so attractive in the past because of challenges with either uh, with weed control primarily. So uh now I'm showing you uh, one that's commercially available, this uh, row shaver. So ours was uh, custom made, right? But this is one that's uh, now online. You can purchase this you know, from this company. It's uh, called the row shaver. They really are marketing not so much toward the organic no-till community, but more towards people that are dealing with herbicide resistant weeds. But they have a really nice website, a lot of uh, YouTube videos that you can check out and you can see what's been done in this area. So really uh, interesting you know, to kind of watch you know the evolution of the inter-row mowing and you know how different people are approaching this uh, i want to just uh share now um some of annika's uh research so um so she was looking at this past summer uh in new york looking at really uh the weed zapper the inter-row mower and then using high seeding rates in soybean you know for weed management and her questions were you know which one of these weed management tactics is going to be more effective and what does it look like when you combine them? Do you get better weed suppression? Is there a you know, potential for a synergistic interaction? All right, so that's um, kind of the basis of her thesis or of her uh, master's thesis. Uh, these are the treatments, okay? She had a control treatment where nothing was done, where just the soybean were no-till planted into that rolled crimp cereal rye. There was a high uh, soybean uh, seeding rate, okay? There was the inter-row mower and then the weed zapper. And then each combination of the ease. So there are the two-way combinations and then the three-way combination. And then she also included a weed-free control, right? So each, uh, each experiment had four blocks and then it was repeated in three separate fields, okay? 
So you should have collected a nice amount of data over the summer. Um, uh, again, the three fields. So two of the three fields, they had cereal rye in them. Uh, one was, um, you know, we knew it was going to be very clean. It, it, it was uh, managed conventionally, did not have a very high wheat seed bank, had a beautiful stand of rye, and it was uh, relatively weed free. Um, there was, a, you know, kind of more standard, this XE field, you know, it had rye in it, but it was moderately weedy. And then we went into a field that didn't have any cereal rye, like worst case scenario, right? You know, if you don't have any weed suppression from the mulch, you know, this is what it would look like. So bare ground, no-till planting, and we just wanted to you know, like really heavy weed pressure, if you will. Okay. So, you know, we had cereal rye, you know, 150 uh, pounds of seed per acre. We drilled that uh, and then we rolled, rolled it down at Anthesis in June. We planted soybeans into it at 175,000 seeds per acre. That was the standard base rate. And then again, for that treatment, the high seeding rate treatment, it was, um, I think, uh, another 50,000 seeds on top of that. So, so those are the, a little bit about the treatments, right? So the high uh, soybean seeding rate, this is, you know, uh, we were really uh, thinking about, you know, how these uh, different tactics would, you know, suppress weeds. And here we were really thinking about, you know, the seeding rate, high seeding rate, that competition that's really targeting weeds that are coming up within the row, right? Okay, and so just keep that in mind. And it's again, it's shading is the mechanism here. And then for the inter-row mower, you know, we're targeting weeds that are coming up between the rows, okay? You know, so there's a spatial separation, okay? So you can see, you know, what that looked like. You know, we had some uh, some mustard out here and, and this is that, that really weedy field without any, um, uh, cereal rye mulch in it, you know, you can see quite weedy. And then we had a, a weed zapper. So this has been interesting looking at the electric weed management here or going, there's a basically a generator here and then this boom, and there's an electrical charge that's delivered to weeds. And so this is, uh, you know, something that, you know, we're seeing um, uh, being used more often now. Again, a lot of people thinking about controlling herbicide resistant weeds. Some organic farmers are now uh, getting involved in this. And so we wanted to compare these, these different tactics, these different tools here, okay? So these are our results. And when we combine the results across all three fields that we were in, okay? Annika found that uh, the inter-row mower, so this, this treatment here, anything with an eye in it, that's where we really saw a nice you know, reduction in our weed biomass. Um, the weed zapper uh, and the high soybean seeding rate, they did not really perform as well as we were expecting. Uh, but the inter-row mower, and you can see any, any of the treatments that have the eye in it, you know, here's the high seeding rate plus the inter-row mower, here's the inter-row mower with the weed zapper, and here are all three. And we're getting that nice reduction, but it's really coming from that inter-row mower. So, you know, that's, um, you know, why uh, we're so excited about this inter-row mower. We're seeing some, you know, good success right off the bat with it. Um, however, that's only part of the story, right? We're combining the three fields here. If we take a, a, a closer look and we you know, look at each field separately. So we have the three fields. We can see that there are basically no weeds in E4, that one field, very clean, uh, clean conditions. And then the, the V Northeast. Um, and so that was the um, um, field that was, uh, you know, very, very weedy, uh, no cereal rye mulch there. And then X East and had some cereal rye, but it was moderately weedy. But you again, you can see that same thing, that same idea here. You know, the treatments that have the inter-row mowing, especially in that weedy field, can really reduce those that weed biomass, you know, clean things up, okay? So looking at this supplemental auxiliary kind of weed management, and we think that it's uh, certainly, um, I think it has much more potential than say like a high residue cultivator, which has also been promoted and used for uh, supplemental weed control in organic no-till systems. So that's um, you know, a little bit more of the story here, you know, separating out these different uh, fields. And then when we look at the yields here, our soybean yields, um, we had some really nice yields uh, in, you know, for organic no-till, right? Um, you know, really nice yields in that field without any weeds, E4, you know, we're up above, you know, 75 bushels per acre. You know, that's pretty fantastic. I feel like that's, you know, serious money there in terms of uh, profitability. And then in our other, uh, other fields, you know, the really uh, weedy field uh, and even the moderately uh, weedy field, you know, we're looking at, you know, 40 you know, bushels per acre, 45, you know, I feel like that's a, a bit more realistic. But what we see here is that in those fields that um, where we're having seen lower yields, you know, when we look at the weed free treatment over here, you know, that's, you know, our yields are quite high there. So even with the inter row mowing, we're still leaving yield on the table or money on the table, if you will. 
you know, with having some weed competition. So there's still more work to be done in terms of improving, uh, I think, the management with the interrow mowing. You know, this was a, our basically first experience with it. I think there are ways maybe doing multiple passes, looking at different timing, maybe some different modifications to the interrow mowing unit itself. But um, uh, certainly these uh, initial results are very promising. So just some takeaways, you know, we see that the interrow mower was much more effective at reducing weed biomass than the weed zapper and more effective than uh, the high soybean seeding rate. Uh, still, we saw some uh, yield reduction compared to the weed free control. So still more work to be done. And uh, I also just wanted to end by, uh, you know, saying again, thanks uh, Heather and Catherine. And, and uh, you, know, you know, I also wanted to give a shout out to, to Annika again, you know, a really cool work that's being done here, Annika and Udi and, and Kristen. Uh, I also want to mention uh, a new resource for people that are struggling with weed management. This is an excellent new resource. It's available for free through SARE. This was just published, Manage Weeds on Your Farm. And this was uh, uh, put out, you know, basically written by Chuck, Chuck Moeller, who recently passed away as a weed ecologist at, at Cornell University, uh, worked with uh, Tony DiTomaso and John Teasdale. But I mean, a tremendous resource here. If you have, um, they go out, and uh, they give you a lot of information about different tactics and strategies, but they also break down uh, different problematic weeds and they tell you about the ecology and things that you could be doing to help manage those weeds. So uh, don't forget about this, you know, um, do check it out if, uh, and it's available for, for free. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. I hope I didn't go too far over, over time here, Heather. No, we still have time for a, a few questions and Sarah has been answering questions in the chat. So thank you, Sarah, for getting that information to folks. There is a question about any studies on five and a half inch drilled beans, shading, you know, the ground faster, better weed control, probably a white mold nightmare, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Any so feedback. Yeah, I, I I know of some people that um, were using a narrower row um, spacing, five and a half inch. I, I think uh, with a Great Plains drill that had that narrower spacing, and and um, yeah, I think typically you get faster canopy closure, faster shading. Um, I I don't know if it's worth it, you know, in terms of the economics, you know, when you compare that to maybe using a higher seeding rate. And again, you know, with Sarah and I working together on this, it, it's really clear, you know, we're seeing a trade off in. In terms of you know some of the cultural practices you know that shading and that you know getting things tight and having that canopy is great for weed suppression but you know there it comes with the trade-off in terms of you know maybe uh potentially being worse for white mold suppression so something to keep in mind there yeah or do you have anything else to add to that or heather nope <laughs> there is a question about planting green though um into rye something rick clark's working on any, we haven't tried that in organic. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anybody else has. We certainly have a lot of farms planting green conventionally with soybeans and mm -hmm. spraying afterwards. But. Yeah, we're doing an experiment this, uh, this summer looking at going in and, and planting uh, early at, at boot stage and then coming back and rolling. Um, and so, you know, I think that's maybe a little bit more in line with some of the work that uh, Rick has been doing. And I think it's coming from Aaron Silva. And so we're also working with Aaron out in Wisconsin and, and uh, yeah, but you know, some of that work is really interesting. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question, Mike. Good to see you here. Yes. Oh, and he's doing that organically. Thank you. And uh, I guess I don't see any more questions and we are at one o'clock and as we've mentioned many times oh somebody's wondering about small scale harvesting machines for beans i think we're all wondering about that <laughs> i don't know Kristen, do you have any thoughts on that one um i don't know if she's still here by then um i i don't know anything that's self-propelled i mean as far as i know really it tends to be a stationary fresher but that would be very cool agreed been interesting. I've been working with some of the research equipment folks like Almaco as an example, and they're starting to realize that there could be quite a market for them with small scale growers. And, you know, I think at least those of us in the research world know that small doesn't mean cheap as far as equipment goes. 
And, you know, the challenge with companies like Almeco is that their um, equipment, even though it's really small and it's made to harvest small amounts, it's very, very expensive. But um, they are very, they're really interested in exploring this, you know, market um, potentially. So who knows, they may come out with a, a line geared for small growers. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone today, and you will be hearing from us much more frequently on dry beans, as you heard. And uh, thanks for joining us today. And for those who are signed up for the Anatomy of Flower webinar, we'll see you next week. Otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.